Daniel Pierce, better known as Eats Everything, is an English DJ and record producer. He came to prominence in 2011 with the release of Entrance Song on Pets Recordings. Dan began his DJ career at Infamous Sash Heresy at Club Loco Japan and was soon permanently placed as a resident with Bristol Knight Rip Snorter in the early 2000s. Since his first residency, he has DJed every weekend for the last 20 years in the world's biggest club institutions such as Fabric, DC10, Watergate and festivals such as Glastonbury, Ultra Music Festival and Secret Garden Party. Most recently, he secured a BBC Radio 1 residency with Pete Tong and runs his edible imprint and eight records alongside friend Andreas Campo. Few producers in the history of dance music have made such a rapid and far-reaching impact on the electronic music scene as eats everything. We travelled to Bristol as part of our Behind the Headphones series to discuss his career, his inspirations and future plans. Let's talk about uh, Bristol and the West Country. What was it like growing up around this area? Were you into, like, into music at an early age? Yeah, I mean, for me, growing up in... I grew up in a little town, sort of 20, 20, 20 ish miles from here, called Water Under Edge, which is uh, like a market town. It's a bit of a hole. It's, a bit, it's nicer now, actually. It's got, I drove up there trying to keep my son asleep. If I got like an eight week old baby trying to keep him asleep, I'd go for like a, an hour, an hour and a half, like radius drive. And I always, I went up through Wooten and I've been there for a few years and it was like, they got like posh shops and stuff. Yeah. It used to just be an absolute <laughs> hole. But we, um, I grew up there, but obviously being close to Bristol and being surrounded by friends with older brothers, rave music became something we were into like from when we were 11, 12 years old. So it was, we were coming into Bristol and we were going to raves like Dreamscape and stuff at 13, 14, which is pretty... Uh, yeah, it's because it's also... It's, Bristol is a very creative city itself, yeah. isn't it? And so were you able to get into like the clubs around here or was it like illegal parties you're going to? What's... Well, we, we went to um, raves like Dreamscape, which was in Milton Keynes, at the sanctuary in Milton Keynes. And then we came to here, Lakota, <laughs> when we were very young. Um, and we, we went also to a place called um, St. Paul, uh, Eastern Community Centre, sorry. I went to an obsession at Eastern Community Centre and saw like Easy Groove and that. That was the first, that was, I think that was the first rave I went to when I was 14, 14 or 15. And yeah, they just let you in. And I, I, there's no way I looked 18. And when you started going to these raves, at what point did you like, you know that you wanted it, this to be your lifestyle? Was, was... What? Um, it was just, it was just, it, the music was everything to, to, to me and all my mates. It was, you know, we lived and breathed it. And I started DJing when I was 12. And we, we just, whenever a new tape pack came out, there was a shop up in um, Park Row, which is just up there, called Jasper's, which would sell, just, you go in there, you pick up all your flyers, because everyone had flyers all over their wall. And you go in and they would, he had like, all these tape packs, you know, Amnesia House, which is drum and bass parties, all the or jungle re, jungle tape packs, hardcore tape packs, house ones, acid, acid techno, everything. And you just had a plethora of all these things and you just go in there, you'd have like 20 quid. And you could buy a tape pack on one tape and we'd all get a different one. And then we'd all share them. It's and what was what was the sounds like? Cause um, I came, grew up in like Kent and that was very drum and bass orientated. For us, it was old school hardcore, like rave, like, you yeah. know, breakbeat hardcore. Um, and techno trance and acid techno, they were the f they were the three sort of genres I was introduced really to, like pretty heavy yeah. techno, uh, techno trance, which was this guy called DJ called Len E, which you, uh, you can't find him. Oh, there's one tape of him. A ghost, in really. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, there's one tape from the warehouse in Plymouth, yeah. and that is it. It's the only thing I can find of him online. And and then yeah, hardcore, all kinds of hardcore, jungle as well. But at the time. Jungle didn't really exist. Yeah, it, it was, was kind of like, a thing. Yeah, yeah. it's becoming a thing. So at the time, it was just hardcore, and then that's what hardcore house was saying. What What were you doing, sort of, before you became, I guess, a professional DJ? How What were you sort of gigging on the side? Were you working on the side? How did that sort of change happen? That I mean, I DJ. I DJed from the age of twelve. I started DJing when I was twelve, and I got my first gig in a club when I was sixteen. I won a won a uh, DJ competition 
by a local DJ who's a massive DJ at the time called Easy Groove. Well, he wasn't at the time, but he had been. He was yeah, one of the yeah, big of hardcore DJs of Carl Cox. He, at the time, it was Carl yeah. Cox and Easy Groove. And he ran a uh, DJ competition at a place called Bar 150. And I won the competition and I got a residency at a club called the Club Loco, which is just literally up there. Yeah, yeah. And his party called Groove Easy. And that was my first gig. And then from that, from then, I played like once a month there. Yeah. And then I got other gigs. And I didn't really, I DJed every, pretty much every weekend I, until lockdown. Yeah, <laughs> I DJed yeah, pretty from much that from point. 16 till 30, 40 years old. I DJed almost every weekend of my life, whether it was for my job or just oh, my yeah. hobby. So I read before this that you you worked and you never wanted to go back to that job. Is that how does that motivate you now? Is that a great sort of that's what pushes you forward? I'm motivated you? by fear of what my life was, like not that it was a terrible life, but it was f <laughs> like working in in an office or working on the. I did a lot of building. So, sorry lads, yeah. I did a lot of building site work and there's a bit of camaraderie and stuff that I missed from that but generally that is hard work man, in a different way, DJing and making music is hard work in yeah, one way, of course. but not like that. So I guess when, did you, obviously everyone saw what the, that guy in the government came out and said about things being, uh, the music industry and nightlife being unviable. For someone like when you say stuff like that, how does that make you feel? As in, uh, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, it's for me, it's just such a a blinkered and ridiculous view to take on something that provides joy and and employment to so many people, and to to be so uh, matter of fact that you just have to retrain. Taking in another, it's not even DJs per se, not at all. In fact, yeah. there's really a tiny, tiny piece of the pie. But you, everyone from bar staff, etc. We've all heard it. All the yeah. cliches: your bar staff, your doorman, your even your takeaways that yeah, yeah, work near nightclubs and stuff. They all rely on this. My my view of it is ultimately, no matter what job you do, what do you, what do people want to spend their money on. It doesn't matter. Have to be like electronic music, but. People like to go to the theatre, or they like. It's the one thing. No matter how the world changes, people will always want a, a release. Yeah, and exactly. I think to to ignore that is is such a naive. Just to say to retrain, it's just so, as you say, yeah, naive and a blinkered, and just a really uneducated view of the world. And that, well, yeah, you're a lo basically blanket, and everyone is, who works in the entertainment industry is a lovey yeah. and is a privileged, and you're it's you're, it's a jobby basically. I think sound engineers and lighting engineers actually quite often like unsung heroes, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Because how you get obviously this sort of events where you turn up and it's just like a dark room with a strobe. Yeah. Pulse. But some, now if you look at what the, these big production events, they're they're almost as important. Timing they are. timing the lights to your drop and that stuff. They, it's so pivotal to the. It's completely. They 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 make the parties what they are nowadays. If those kind of parties, the big expansive big big show party yeah. big production parties if they're what you're into then they those guys make that happen and without them what the fuck what it's just you know it's great being in a dark room with a strobe it's brilliant but you know that's not gonna pay the bills it, for everyone and this is i also think it, it's an interesting thing because there's we talk about underground music and sometimes there's that ah uh, that's too commercial but I, I think you have to have some of these big scale stuff. So it, it, it's sort of like the gateway for new newcomers into music as well. Of course, and really, for me personally, there's no such thing as underground anymore. Not in the sense of under what underground was. Underground to me is an acid techno party that is an A4, A3 piece of paper that A1 piece of paper, whatever you get given. A5, I should say. <laughs> Going to get bigger, bigger and bigger. Yeah. <laughs> we'll grab a bit oh, yeah, A5. <laughs> right. no, an A, A1 piece of paper with a little, like, neon bit of paper, woods. Uh, yeah. That's underground. If you've got a Facebook page promoting parties, Isn't you that? are not. On, it's not underground. The, the music might be not non commercial, but you're not under. If you're promoting yourself online in a capacity where you have 30, 40, 50,000 followers, you're not underground. Yeah. And you can't say you are anymore. It's just that that doesn't that type of underground does not does exist. exist. And so, in, in we actually had this conversation uh, with we did spoke to DJ One Man, and he said he raised this idea that you can never go back to proper illegal parties just because of how much stuff's online. 
you can't, you, where do you used to be able to go, wait on the M25, 100 people waiting yeah. for an address. Now, with everyone on Snapchat, your location's gone before. I mean, I don't really look at social media anymore. I've, I've, I've had a few sort of things where I've just like, it's been to me like, I don't need it in my life, but something happened with an illegal rave and a few DJs, friends of mine, some that you know yeah, and have yeah. interviewed, probably, who <laughs> were, I, I, didn't, I didn't see this, but they told me about yeah. it. And that's a prime example of why the illegal parties and that they just because they all of it years ago when f-ing Sasha was playing an illegal rave, Sasha played an illegal rave. That's it. But now these are they're in the Guardian and shit. These yeah, guys, yeah. These guys. And maybe maybe was it irresponsible? I'm not gonna I'm not that's gonna not get involved judged. in that. But you, you can't have anything like that anymore. It's every d- d- dance music as a, as a, a as a wide ranging genre is so popular now, and that's because of the internet. That these opportunities to get your camera out and film it, they've they've kind of decimated that illegal yeah. rave culture now. So you mentioned uh, by music. Is there sort of any young artists that you're you're looking at the minute, or you think give a heads up to? Or? There's this wicked guy in um, from America that we just signed to Edible called Cryptogram. Who um, I don't know what else he's put stuff out on. I, I'm, I'm really bad at. Um, <clears throat> All I do is if I get tunes and, you like and I it, like them, you play sound. Them. Yeah, yeah. I don't really do any research. Of the, the, so it's all about the music. Yeah, really. the person not, yeah. Who, who made it and what they've released on previously. Because I think if you if you form an opinion on what they've done previously, then you, you might not sign issues. them. Yeah, You've got all what they've released on this label, and it's not very cool or whatever. Yeah. To the to the. And I it, mean, then you might might not sign it. Yeah. Whereas if you just listen to the music on the music for the music's sake, then you're more likely to sign it so this guy cryptogram he's been he's one that of all the demos i've been sent recently i'm like oh fuck me these, these are really out. good black girl white girl who who aren't new but have kind of switched up what they were doing what they're doing and it's more like this sort of really quite quick funky techno i suppose on a truncate yeah. kind of vibe do you think the the scene is what it's going to change when we sort of come out of this and I get things go back to sort of more grassroots artists as well or be more space for grassroots because with people not being able to travel as freely and um, there's not necessarily going to be big capacity venues yeah. to pay big fees do you think there'll be we'll see a more grassroots approach do you know what I the only thing I thought we would see and and, and I hope we will this is I'm the, it's hard to really gauge what's going to happen my hope is that it will go back to for me as a DJ anyway, it will go back to a thing I never experienced, the mid 90s, where I'm just playing in the UK, Ireland, UK and Ireland, yeah. and you're booting it up the motorway and doing like three gigs in a night. I, I, I'm, I will happily take way less money. I'm not, but the money was never something that I did you it set for. Out for it's, yeah. it's, 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 I, I was happy being a 500 pound yeah. set DJ. That's all I ever, my dreams were. I, if I you're happy to play. And yeah, and yeah. I'd do three gigs a weekend, three gigs a Friday, three gigs, and I'd earn like three grand, and it's like, <laughs> me. I mean, that is still <laughs> loads of money yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean um, so if, if it went back to a stage where I was just playing in the UK and Ireland and occasionally went to Spain or Australia but the main hub was in the UK I'd love that but I don't know what's going to happen it's impossible yeah, to, to say tell, isn't it? because Brexit's going to f- the travel up for us going to places yeah. and them coming and people from abroad coming here it's going to make it loads more difficult so do people just stick with the UK well, DJs and the grassroots, yeah, yeah the youngsters it's, getting a It's go. sort of what you see in Eastern Europe, actually. Like, obviously, you've got big money places in Eastern Europe, but when you look at, we have a young artist, Reese, um, he got booked in Lithuania, and like, he's a 500 quid DJ over here, yeah. sort of emerging, breaking through. But he's booked as a headliner over there because these countries can't and these promoters can't afford to really pay. Yeah, so for, like, but they their lineups are all homegrown from yeah. one city, and it, it's quite an interesting approach. Yeah, it's sort amazing. of like the Berlin approach, really, as well, isn't yeah, it? Berlin Lots of little. Is, yeah, the, you don't, the Berlin's like when I play in Berlin, you, you and like this again, fees don't drive. Yeah. But I didn't, you don't get paid anywhere near. No, not you at all. Did, yeah, you get in similar cities in similar size or similar destination cities yeah. you don't get paid you get paid yeah. way less but you, you do it because you just love DJ. yeah you, and it's you, well, you want to play in those and places wicked. don't you like and playing at Watergate and stuff like that is you get to play for seven or eight hours yeah a wicked venue and Watergate, yeah isn't it? amazing and you get to just control it yeah so it's you, just amazing do you prefer, you've mentioned there about playing for six seven eight hours 
is that something you would like to see more of? Longer sets? I, if, if I could, if, it, if you could guarantee, if it's, 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 you don't want to play for seven or eight hours in somewhere you don't know. Yeah. And you don't know the crowd, and you don't know whether it's. If you get, but you turn up to play in, I'm going to say any old country. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You get booked to play. No one really knows who you are, and you're playing for eight hours to f-ing twenty people. Yeah. That's no it, good. Yeah, really cool. But if you if you know like you do a UK tour, for example, or you do like you play in the places you 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 know, and you can play for and you can control the room, then I'd be all for that. And I think it's it's a measure of a DJ if they can play for more than an hour, two hours, three hours. And yeah, I, I would like to see that up and down the country. And the, the resident, I would love to just do like a residency here, a residency in Leeds. This idea of the resident, like you used to have people like Danny Tanaglia playing for his 14 yeah. hours, playing seven days a week in one club. Yeah. Yet I feel that that brings a whole different night, a style to the night as well, isn't to it? To the crowd as yeah. well. And if you look at, for me, the best party is actually, um, I always reference Sub Club, but it's, 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 built, a, it's built around residencies yeah. and like there's se- you're seeing the same people in the crowd, the yeah. same DJs with like a friend of theirs coming yeah, along yeah. to play. And it, it just builds that community spirit, I Completely. think. Completely. Yeah. That's the thing with Subby, whenever you play there, any of the DJs in, in, the, in sort of my circuit, when you play Subby, you always, for me, I either play from the start till the end, or there'll be, you know, one of one of the local guys yeah, yeah. who will, that I know really well, yeah. who'll play for an hour and a half, and then I'll play the, yeah. the other, other three and a half, four hours. And so, yeah, if I could do a residency, yeah, as I say here, one in Leeds, one in Subby, one in Belfast, uh, yeah. uh, Telegraph, Telegraph building, 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 yeah, yeah, I'll do that. You got the perfect every set, month. The perfect setup then. <laughs> you completed Mate, it. I'd be, yeah, completed <laughs> it. That's it. I'm done. And I'd take Might drop take out like there. no money at all, guys. So let's set it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mate, I'd Shout see, out that'd all be, the yeah, yeah, all of you guys. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm saying. But the thing is that that would be so wicked and you could really cultivate a party. Well, this is it. I think this is the important thing, isn't it? Actually, you need to, that way, people get an understanding of what they're coming to see. You, like you said, you don't want to go somewhere and not understand the crowd as well. So you know, as an artist, what, what works for them, but also how far you can take them in a way that it's going to push them a bit as yeah. well and f- i think i'll ask you the question but for me i think it's important for artists to sort of take risks a bit massively it, how i don't want to go and see the same set that you played when i saw you like a couple of months yeah, before yeah, do you know no, I mean? yeah, otherwise mate, i totally. should have just gone back to there they, people aren't satisfied with seeing yeah. the same person once a month because they can see on instagram that this guy playing here this girl playing there this person playing there do you know what i mean and so they they there's that almost FOMO. Yeah. So I don't know whether, but there, obviously there are people that would be totally down for the residency thing, but I don't think it can be on a big scale. It can be subby yeah, sized sure. places. And I think, um, and another thing with that, like you, you say this about seeing people everywhere. Like I work in music, but my mates consume way more music and they're telling me about, got to check this person out. And that, I'm thinking, how the hell are you finding out about yeah, all of yeah, this? Yeah. this and this is it, the consumer actually knows so much, so much about all yeah, of this. Yeah, they, they drive it at the end of the day. So in an ideal world, in a perfect world, if you, if I could have just a few residencies and play gigs here, there, I'm never gonna go back to touring like I did yeah. before lockdown. That's never, I'm never, I never wanna go. Yeah, it's not. I never wanna go and play 150 gigs a year. As, um, I don't, I'm like, that doesn't interest yeah. me anymore. I've realized now, it, I was killing myself. It's quite a glorious life on social media. This getting on a fly and traveling around and playing three, three countries on different continents in a weekend. But actually, realistically, it's not, it's not a nice lifestyle, is it? Because no, it's a, a painful lifestyle. Yeah. And it's not I'm not complaining. Complain you can't you can't complain about it, but you can you can sort of allude to the actual. Well, it has its own problems. Yeah, of it? course. Like, like if you, when you're doing those kind of weekends where you're playing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you're doing, you know, you've literally you finish the gig and then you go straight to the airport and you get on the plane and you sleep on the plane, then you land and you're playing a daytime party, then you're playing the after party. And it's, again, I'm not complaining, it sounds wicked, but do that 150 times a year. Yeah, because also you need to, like, you're always going to be at your best when you're fresh. Totally. And so, like... Or off your face. Yeah, <laughs> one and the other. Yeah. But it's, you you also want to give the best experience to the, the people there course, as well. So sometimes thing. you have to make the little sacrifices within that. Totally, and the thing is, I, I mean, I don't get on it 
anywhere near like I used to like seven or eight years ago. So I, you, I would only pick my battles when I partied. Because also I guess with touring, it's how productive things like going in the studio and having time to work they on don't, that. They just don't happen. For me personally to make music, I need to have at least three days where I can, so I get in the first day, and you don't really do anything on the first day, but you know mentally that you've got day two day and two. day three, and by middle of day two, you're, you're, you're rolling. Do you have um, ever have issues and maybe lockdown with staying motivated as well? No, not in no. lockdown either. No. Lockdown music. It's been the no, opposite. For me, it's been, it's been a revelation for me. I don't want to like cheer on lockdown <laughs> in certain aspects. Yeah. But, I've had a kid in lockdown, which would sound like All a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Start yeah, to not, finish. Oh, yeah, quickly, like, <laughs> 18 years. Yeah, it's turned up the temperature a bit. Yeah, it's been like in the most productive I've ever been in. I literally have made over 100 tunes. And I would say of those, 30 of them are good, good. and will do <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? For me, that's like, I've, ne I've never done that. I've and never done that. Is that. Have you changed your process in that? Or has it just been yeah, having just the time, having time to time? Just to do having, it? like, I, to be fair, when it had, I have changed my process. I had, because I took, when lockdown happened, my studio was in Barton Hill. Yeah. And I had to take, I had to Picks pick which home. bits. Pick, yeah, yeah. Pick, so I just took my monitor speakers home, a MIDI keyboard, and that was it. And I put in the spare room, and I made music like I was making 10 years ago. Yeah. Do you think that having like... Less gear. Yeah, and because, again, talking to different people, like sometimes like you actually fill up these studios, you see them, or wicked studios, but, but actually probably stripping everything back and totally. slowing down, it allows yeah. you to like utilize things. Totally, better. I mean, I had, when I, I got so into it, just literally having MIDI keyboard and just soft synths, I didn't have any, any gear, outboard gear at all, not one little bit. And I, the tunes were flying out. And then I got, I got back into the studio in sort of mid June. And I, I made, I'm probably made 60 or 70 at home in, in three months. And then since I've been in the studio, I've made like 30 or 40. So that, and in a longer time, and I've made less tunes because I'm, oh, there's that zip over yeah, there. Yeah. I, I'm like. We maybe overcomplicate it. Yeah, by like just like you want to, and whilst it's wicked <laughs> about this stuff, productivity wise, do, going back to how I learn, because obviously I've only got outboard gear since I've got earned more money yeah. and I've explored and it's amazing but for, for me on a productivity sort of scale just sitting with my MIDI keyboard and you know speakers right there in my yeah. face because my studio is like you know it's a big old room and it's all sound treated and it's it's the bollocks it's great yeah. but it's I'm definitely not as productive in it as I was at home yeah. mad <laughs>